on page 1,231 in the Church Bibles. So that's Jude, page 1231. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, instinct like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. <clears throat> they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. 
be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Claire, great job. Thank you very, very much. Do, um, do keep uh, that passage open, please, in front of you. Um, you'll see on page eight of the handouts, uh, I've given this sermon the title, How Should We Stand Up for Jesus? And if I'm honest, I don't really like it, actually. I think it's a bit of a rubbish title. It sort of implies that Jesus is getting bullied in the playground and uh, that we're required to don our superhero cloaks and, and come to his rescue. So uh, that isn't what I mean at all. I, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, what Jude is saying, and, and what I'm trying to say in the title, is that Jude is, is making it clear that Christians must contend for the truth about Jesus. That there are certain people uh, who deny Jesus his rights, if you like, his right to be, to be king, his right to be in charge. Those are the, the two things that Jude says that Jesus has because of who he is. And that Christians must stand up, stand with Jesus, perhaps not stand up for Jesus, but stand with Jesus on that truth. Firstly, in our own lives, uh, we want to obey his word. We want to obey his word individually, particularly when we don't agree with it. That's the challenge, isn't it? It's easy to obey God's word when you agree with it. Uh, I think uh, God's word says you should forgive me. I, I really agree with that. Yeah, I'm all for that. God's word says I should deny myself, and that's more tricky. I find that harder. Well, if Jesus is sovereign and Lord, then I need to treat both of those truths equally. I can't just pick the ones I like and, and forget the ones I don't. And as a church, standing with Jesus, calling on others to honor him as sovereign and Lord. And, and these verses, that we've, well, the next verses we've come to, 17 to 23, are going to tell us how we're to do that. Uh, but let me pray for us as we, as we come to them. Uh, Lord Jesus, we want to begin by saying we honour you. We honour you as sovereign and Lord over our lives and over the life of, of this church family. You have the right uh, to be in charge of us, the right to rule over our church. Please would you humble us before your majestic word this morning. Please would you cause the goodness of your love to be, to be, to be seen and cause it to rule over us. We pray this because you're the king. Amen. How should we respond? Well, the, the first thing is, in responding to false teaching, the key thing is, don't panic. Don't panic. Uh, have a look at verses 17 uh, and 18. But dear friends, Jude writes, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and who do not have the Spirit. Don't panic. The Lord reigns. Not one single hair of your head falls to the ground but that he knows about it and that he's ordained it. So false teaching in the church is, is, shouldn't be a source of panic. God is not surprised by false teaching. He's not caught on the hop. He's not suddenly, suddenly having to rush round and trying to organize some sort of uh, exciting defensive strategy. Don't panic. Corporal Jones, of course, of the Warmington-on-Sea Home Guard Battalion, was famous, whenever things got a bit sticky in Dad's army, was famous for panicking while shouting all the time, don't panic. <laughs> we mustn't panic because God is sovereign and Lord. He's sovereign and Lord 
even over false teaching. In fact, he tells us that in the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. This is going to happen, Jesus says, so don't panic. The book of Psalms is rich in the idea of a scoffer, someone who laughs at the frankly old-fashioned notion that God will return to judge the living and the dead, that God gets to say what is good and what is evil, and that he will on the last day make decisions about how we have lived our lives, how we have related to him. Now, it makes sense that if you, if you scoff at that idea, if you laugh at that, if you want to dismiss that, if you think that is, is, is nonsense, then it's not a big step, is it, to change what the church has always taught. If Jesus isn't sovereign and Lord, then it's a small thing to say, actually, this is a bit inconvenient, I don't really like it, uh, it doesn't quite suit with what I want, so I'm going to get rid of it. Denying yourself, Rory... Just park it, if God's not sovereign and Lord. And when that happens, we're not to panic. When others teach that, we're not to panic. We're to remember the teachings of Jesus and, and the apostles, Peter and Paul, and their warnings. That these things are serious, and they will cause us to, to have to stand with Jesus but we shouldn't be surprised. This isn't anything outside the normal Christian life. Will it be hard? Yes. Will it be unpleasant? Yes. But it's not unexpected. So let's not panic. It's good to remember, isn't it, the cross. The greatest evil ever perpetrated by humanity. We killed God. And God wonderfully used that act of evil, that ultimate rejection of him as sovereign and Lord, to save. That's how powerful God is. So don't panic. Well, if we're not to panic, what is it we're to do? Uh, well, the first thing we're to do is to fit your own mask first. You ever been on an aeroplane? I hope you pay attention to the safety breach, the briefings on the aeroplane. I, I don't fly very often, but I'm always fascinated to know how, in the event of the, there being a problem, I should get off the aeroplane. I think that's really important information. I'm quite keen to know it. But one of the things they say is, in the event of a loss of cabin pressure, masks will drop from the panel overhead, pull the mask towards you, fit it over your nose and mouth, and then breathe normally. Please fit your own mask first before helping others. When it comes to standing with Jesus as sovereign and Lord, we are to fit our own masks first. As we contend, we do so by keeping ourselves in God's love. Have a look down, please, at verses 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, Jude writes, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Fit your own mask first. And, and just notice, I think this is interesting, notice who Jude is writing to. Verse 20, did you see it? But you, dear friends, members of the church where this letter is being read, Jude is writing to them. He is writing, if you like, to us. Actually, it's exactly the same there in verse 17 and 18. But dear friends, and verse 18, they said to you, this is our job. Our job to stand with Jesus, to contend against false teaching. As lovely as it would be to, uh, to think, well, this is someone else's job, you know, this is the, uh, this is the clergy's job. Probably, you know, they should be doing that. That's excellent. Perhaps it's the PCC's job. The chumps got voted on. They can jolly well do something about it. But Jude says no. No, dear friends, it is our job. The people who are sitting in church listening to this letter from Jude being read, that you are to 
contend. You are to build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Verse 21, I think, is the, is the key verse for us. Keep yourselves in God's love. Jude, in a moment, is going to go on to say it's dangerous. Dangerous to contend. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to stand with Jesus against false teaching. That it will be costly. He says, actually, it's going to be frightening because of the eternal consequences of this false teaching. So before we embark on this, he's very clear we need to go to the gym. We need to bulk up a little bit. We need to, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to delight ourselves in God's word, immerse ourselves in his love. And how are we to do it? Well, three verbs. Three verbs. The first is build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Did you see that? Uh, it's right there, isn't it, in verse 20. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Jude says this is what will keep you in God's love. And that is consciously, intentionally, wanting to grow in your faith. Is that your aim? Do you think, oh, I'd love to love Jesus more today than I did yesterday. It's not a bad thing to pray, is it, the start of the morning? Lord Jesus, please help me to love you more today than I did yesterday. Building yourself up in your most holy faith. Do you have a plan for that? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, um, uh, if you want to get fit, it doesn't just happen. You don't just sort of stumble into feeling better. You don't just find yourself accidentally eating more healthily. Oh, I just found myself snacking on some lovely broccoli. Oh, so nice. I went to the broccoli tin and there it was and I thought, oh, a little broccoli. It doesn't accidentally happen, does it? You have to first get rid of all the Kit Kats and then only have broccoli and then you find yourself snacking on broccoli. But you've got a plan to do that. You don't just fall into healthy eating, you don't just fall into healthy living. We don't just fall into growing as Christian people. We've got a plan to do it. Plan to take the time to read God's Word. Plan to take the time to meet with God's people together on a Sunday, to sing His praise, to pray together. It'd be odd, wouldn't it? If we, I wonder how it would change our time together if we thought, what's happening now is actually I'm coming to a spiritual gym. I'm seeking to build myself and build others up in their most holy faith. How would that change the time we spent before the service, perhaps? How might we pray? How would that change the time we spent after the service? How might we want to speak with one another and pray for one another after the service if we thought this is the time? when I, I build my spiritual muscles, when we together build our spiritual muscles. As we build, we are also to pray. Now, that's the second verb. Pray in the Holy Spirit. In fact, we can't pray out of the Holy Spirit, can we? He, his job is to make us cry out, Abba, Father, So it's simply, I think, in Jude's case, a contrast between those people who, who don't have the Spirit, who cause division, uh, verse 19, and Christian people who have the Spirit and who express that through prayer. Keep yourselves in God's love by praying in the Holy Spirit. There is no other way to pray. We need to pray that we'd be kept loving Jesus, that we'd submit our lives to him, that we wouldn't say no to his word. We, we need to pray as we, as we have done that new believers would put down good, healthy roots into the gospel. We need to pray that those who teach would teach the whole truth, uh, that they would be kept from false teaching. 
We need to pray that those who do teach things that are wrong about Jesus, that deny his right to be sovereign and Lord, would repent. Please pray for yourselves. Use the prayer diary. It's brilliant that that is such a resource. Pray in your growth groups. Pray in your families. Pray with your, your children's group leaders. Pray for those who are teaching our children now. Pray that we wouldn't be naive. Pray that we would be able to discern the truth of the gospel uh, from the error of the world. Thank you so much for those who came uh, to pray last Sunday evening uh, as a church family. It was really important. It was great to be together. Uh, we're next meeting on, um, on Monday the 20th on Zoom. Do plan to be there if you possibly can. Last verb. It's perhaps the most surprising of all as we seek to keep ourselves in the love of God, and that is to wait Wait. Have a look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. I'm not a particularly patient person. If I have to wait too long to turn out of um, uh, North Street car park by Asda, I become increasingly sort of twitchy. I'm on my bike. I'm thinking, should I have gone? Perhaps I missed it. And the danger is, of course, that I will throw myself in front of uh, your car as you're driving along Uh, to a very sticky end. And there is a danger for a lack of spiritual patience as well. A lack of patience in the Christian life can leave me open to false teaching. I know that one day uh, everything will be perfect and my lack of patience as I wait for that can leave me wide open here and now. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Fit your own oxygen mask first. And having done so, we're at last in the position to stand with Jesus, to assert his rights as sovereign and Lord. And our attitude as we do this, very simple. We are to have mercy. We are to have mercy. Now, it helps me to think, well, how was I when I was denying Jesus as sovereign and Lord? We all were at some point. If you're a Christian here, you're simply someone who's come to have moved from denying him as sovereign and Lord, as being in charge, to now accepting him as sovereign and Lord. His response to that rejection, that denial, was mercy. Not to treat us as we deserve, but to move towards us in grace. And so as we contend, we're to show mercy. Have a look down, please, at verses 22 and 23. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire, save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Show mercy. Showing mercy does not mean saying, well, I disagree with what you're saying, but I'll let you carry on. That's not mercy, that's, that's cowardice. Imagine I'm walking past the common pond, it's a lovely hot summer's day, and I see a group of people, uh, they're probably youths, we'll blame them anyway, it's normally best. We see a group of youths diving into, a, into the, the common pond, it's far too shallow, you know it's going to end badly. It is not merciful to shake your head ruefully and go, oh, youth of today, eh? That's not mercy. That's neglect. Mercy is to say, please don't do that. You'll hurt yourself. Mercy is to discourage others from joining the back of the queue to dive in, even if you're likely to be laughed at and ignored. Jude identifies three different groups who are in need of merciful rescue. Uh, The first is those who are being drawn into false teaching. Jude says, mercifully, seek to to bring them back. It's going to take patience and time and and love and probably lots of listening. We'll need to try and understand what is it about this particular area of false teaching that appears so attractive. These people aren't fully signed up uh, to denying Jesus the right to be in charge, to denying him the right to be sovereign and Lord. They're just beginning to think, oh, I wonder... Did God really say that? They're just beginning to say, did did God really say sexual activity is only to be between a man and a woman in a a committed, lifelong relationship that's called marriage? 
Well, to them, we are to be merciful. Merciful to those who doubt. Jude's second group, they aren't just questioning, they are playing with fire. Verse 23, snatch others from the fire and save them. They've begun to engage with this kind of thinking, with the lifestyle of those who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality, to use the words of verse 4. There's real danger here. They need saving. And the merciful thing here is to pray and to try and to grab them quickly before the fire takes hold. To warn them, listen, this guy's off beam. Don't listen to him. That's not true. Don't, Don't read that. It's just not good for you. And the third rescue mission concerns those who've become fully involved in this teaching, who by their life and their lips deny the right of Jesus Christ to be in charge. They aren't wondering, did God really say? They're teaching, God did not say. And our response here is is to be different, still merciful, but different. Have a look, please, at verse 23. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear. It's still merciful. It's mercy all the way through. But there's this odd phrase, isn't there? Mercy mixed with fear. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. We should be afraid. We should be afraid for the people who are beginning to teach this stuff because they are running the risk of judgment. Maybe we should be afraid of our own hearts, worried that that as we seek to be merciful to them, we will be tempted to join them. Maybe we'll be afraid because they seem eloquent and powerful and because so many other people agree with them uh, and, and we realize that we don't. We are to be merciful towards them while hating what they're doing. The, uh, the allusion here is to Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. Uh, but the idea is of repentance, of God's mercy extending to his people, the people who'd rejected him, who'd, who'd gone into exile. And he'd rescued them from exile. And and the picture of his rescue is of the taking away of filthy robes and giving them robes of righteousness. Christians are called to hate those, those deeds done which reject Jesus, which deny him the right to be sovereign and Lord. We're to have nothing to do with them. We are to repent of them. We're to turn away from them. We're to hate them. We love the repentant sinner. As repentant sinners, we love fellow repentant sinners. But we cannot love, we do not love, approve of, or bless what Jesus calls us to turn away from. You can't say to the incessant grumbler, the nitpicker, that those sins aren't sins that have to be put to death as a Christian. Grumbling and dissatisfaction and fault-finding is something which we are to hate, not which we're to go, oh, well, you know, had a tough life. We're not to say to the serial liar, do you know what? All truth is relative. It doesn't matter if you lie these days because, well, what is truth anyway? That's fine. You can carry on as a Christian lying your socks off. We cannot say to those who claim that sexual activity outside of marriage is holy, is right. We cannot say to them that God agrees with them, that they have no need to turn away from their sin. We must show mercy and we must hate their sin just as we hate our sin, just as we hate all sin. Standing with Jesus will need us to be spiritually strong. We must keep ourselves in the love of God and will need us to be merciful. Why don't I pray that we might be those two things? Lord Jesus, we begin by saying thank you for your mercy, that while we were still far off, you loved us and brought us home. While we were denying you the right to be sovereign and Lord, to be king, to to rule over us, to have the last word, 
to define what is good, what is right, uh, while we were rejecting you, you came towards us, and in your mercy you died for us. Thank you. In light of that mercy, please enable us to stand with Jesus, to assert his rights, to contend for the faith, full of love, love for him and love for others. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.